Uh, do you want to say a little something about Mustafa? Yeah, so I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who is tuning in um, to this live. So this is to talk about the uh, Outward Facing exhibition that is currently up at One Fordham Plaza in the Bronx uh, through to July 30th. Um, this collaboration and this exhibition was made in part with a collaboration with the NYC uh, Department of Transportation and uh, nonprofit Shashama. Uh, and today we're just talking a little bit about the exhibition, how it came about, and each individual artist's um, work and their processes. And for those of you who don't know that much about Shashama, Shashama is a nonprofit art organization that um, works with property owners um, to transform unused space into space to create and space to present uh, for artists all around New York City. And I'm going to hand over the mic to Laura James, who is a curator for all these shows. Okay, thank you, Theobar. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. I uh, hope that you're keeping well in, this, uh, in these uncertain times. It's good that we're able to get together anyway, even though it's virtually. Um, you know, once again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we're talking today about our third presentation. This is the third, third of three exhibits. I, I don't want to say final exhibit. I hope that we can do it again sometime, as long as the building is still standing. Um, it, the exhibit has been very well received. Uh, they all have, really. Um, it's great that we're able to still have the work able to be seen because it's outside and there are still people walking around. So we're really fortunate that even though, you know, practically everything is closed, although opening slowly, our exhibits have um, been able to be seen. So, um, this show, we titled it, I titled it Living Walls. Um, basically, uh, artists were invited to submit a proposal to show their work in these windows. And so I, I uh, took different artists and put them together. And, you know, there's really nothing, you know, too like high minded about this work. It's beautiful work and it references nature, you know, and the, diff the three different artists, uh, they, they're all doing that and it all worked together and came out pretty nicely, I must say. And each artist is going to talk some more about their particular project. So we'll, we'll give us a chance to do that. Diambara, do you want to show the short video? We have a video, it's just about a minute or so that shows the work. Diambara? Oh, there we go. That's this is Jennifer, Jennifer's piece, Ocean Altar. get started with Jennifer Tamayalo. Uh, Diabara, if you could go to the, to the next slide. Okay, so living and working in the Bronx, artist Jennifer Tomayala's work explores the play of patterns, figurative illusions, and the landscape. Her imagery is inspired by travels in America, Greece, Cyprus, Turkey, Italy, Spain, Jordan, and Morocco. A proud member of the Bronx art community, Jennifer is a four-time recipient of the Bronx Council on the Arts Rio Award for painting and a former artist in residence at the Bronx Historical Society. She was also a photographer for the Bronx Artist Documentary Project exhibition and subsequent book and currently works at the Bronx River Art Center. Okay, Jennifer. Hi, um, so we're going to go to the slide. Yes. So just to give you a little background, um, <clears throat> my main interest is in the history of art, uh, particularly women in uh, the history of art. 
um, just kind of celebrating the creative spirit that all people display, no matter where they're from, no matter what time it is, people have always made art. Uh, plus respect for nature, which is kind of my secondary theme. Um, I just think art is such an incredible tool for breaking down barriers. It's a very direct way to communicate. And not only uh, for people from different cultures, but from different times. I can look at an artwork from 2000 years ago and, and kind of get an emotional response, which is amazing to me. And I also think that looking at art adds information to kind of the mainstream uh, story of history, because through art, voices that are not heard in mainstream history kind of slip in. <clears throat> and I'm very interested in that. Uh, my particular interest is the history of women, because of course, in uh, you know traditional art history, there aren't a lot of women. But then when you start looking at art, uh, you start seeing women everywhere. And that was where kind of my art starts from is seeing all these women, but not hearing about them. So the first painting I'm showing is called Aurora Under the Tiles. And um, Aurora is a Greek goddess of the dawn. And um, she's also a dancer. I did a, a whole series of dancers uh, with different titles, kind of elevating the dancer, bringing her to goddess status. And she's underneath a pattern that I saw in mosaic at a sanctuary for Aphrodite in Cyprus. And, and that pattern over her is, has several layers to it, you know, that the history is there, but also she's kind of hiding behind it. We really can't see her, not like women in art history and history, and still women today kind of have to put on a facade. Um, we can go on to the next one. I know I don't, I'm trying not to take too long because I know we're supposed to keep it. So this next yeah. one is called Ariadne on the Beach. And, um, Ariadne is a very famous Greek myth, and she is uh, kind of, I think she's the hero of the myth because she, using her intelligence and creativity, helps the male hero, Theseus, escaped, escape the Minotaur. And, um, the, but this is her alone. This is her painting. This is just about her. And again, uh, she's behind a pattern uh, from a Roman mosaic. Move on. Next one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Women at the well. Uh, That's a very common theme you see on ancient bases. And I um, kind of brought it in my own way, abstracting it um, using patterns that I've seen in other places. So if you see there's, it's kind of abstracted. It's two women in between uh, a yellow vase. And here I was just playing with the pattern and the idea of taking this theme and uh, bringing it into kind of a contemporary visual state. Okay, go to the next one. And this last one is called shipwrecks. Um, this is a combination of the Greek wave pattern, which you will see I use again in the living walls um, installation and an Islamic pattern. And to me, I, I painted this in response to the Syrian crisis, the Syrian refugee crisis, um, in the in kind of the combination of the Islamic and Greek and you know how it's still going on and, and there are still people in encampments in Greece under very difficult situations. Um, so, I mean, to me, this painting's very sad. Uh, you can't see it very closely, but there's a lot of people in the water in this painting. Ready? Yep. So now I'm going to talk about the uh, installation I did with Shoshama at Fordham. And it's called Ocean Altar, again, because of the, uh, you, you know, the respect for nature we should have. You know, she, she's our mother and we don't maybe treat her as well as we should. Um, and so this is just an overall view of the entire piece. And if you go to the next one, I will kind of do a quick um, explanation of how I put it together. So this um, project came up after, you know, we were all uh, at our stay at home order. So I was trying to think of what could I do with materials that I already had. 
So what I, how I started is all the sea creatures are made out of paper that I hand marbled at home. So this is kind of my makeshift uh, paper drying rack after I had done um, the paper marbling in my studio with um, just oil and pigments, just literally what I had at home. Um, I, I was really trying to be um, creative. <laughs> you can go to the next. And then here you can see um, I started uh, gathering quite an ocean full of animals in my studio. And these are just a few of the cutouts that I had as I was working on which animals to put inside the installation. And you know, we have, I, I'm, I'm a, I love octopus. There's quite a few octopus in the uh, piece because they're such interesting creatures and they have such an interesting history in art history itself and then lots of other fish and jellyfish. Um, you can go ahead. And I had started experimenting with the Greek wave pattern to put as the background. And what I had decided to do was just to make an entire field of ocean with the animals uh, on t in the ocean, basically. Um, so using uh, a roll of paper, I cut out all the wave patterns and then, um, you know, uh, affixed them to a background paper so they could hang. You can go ahead to the next. And this is just again to show you how it all came together. The animals that were cut out of the marbled paper put up against the Greek wave uh, pattern cut out of paper to make a very large ocean. Um, I really wanted to engage people's imagination with the animals and, and try to make them something that you might stop and look at because you're like, oh, that's kind of funny or interesting or um, you know, something I haven't seen before. You can go ahead to the next. Oh. And then kind of the centerpiece of the ocean altar, altar um, and there's a detail of it later, and it actually showed a little bit better in the video. Um, this is Thalassa. She is a goddess of the sea. Um, I, you can go on to the next one, because I'll talk more about it. I first saw her in a mosaic, um, actually in a church in Jordan. And that is where the initial inspiration for this entire piece came from was this mosaic um, that I saw in Jordan. And, you know, my already, my love of, of female representation and my interest in, in, the, in the ocean in particular, in nature in general, really made me want to create a piece um, to bring her up, to, to, you know, put her in the spotlight. And then when Laura, um, or when I saw this opportunity at Shashama, and I thought that I could build an entire piece around uh, the Sala. That's, and, and if you go to the next, I'll show you the painting again. We can kind of look at her a little bit more closely. Thank you. So she is in the center. And, and I think she has, um, she has her hand up in a very um, iconographic pose of sacredness because I wanted to really get that idea across that this is a sacred woman and she is surrounded by her her fish friends and there's an octopus down in the corner and she has a little uh, banner behind her with an octopus and she has um, little octopi octopodes on her necklace. Um, so the, the, the whole idea of the painting was really just to make something that it expresses, um, you know, not only my love for a goddess of the ocean, but of the ocean itself. And hopefully maybe some people will think about keeping our oceans clean and not too warm. <laughs> so that's, um, that's Ocean Altar, thank you. Well, thank you, Jennifer. How did you get, oh, I'll say, sorry, I'll ask that question later. <laughs> okay. We'll move on to Genevieve. Um, Genevieve Lowe was born and raised in Idaho and currently lives in Brooklyn, New York.
Genevieve received her BA from Colorado, Colorado College in 2006 and her MFA in printmaking from Rhode Island School of Design in 2013. Genevieve's work revolves around conceptions of the American landscape. Utilizing a variety of materials from printmaking to photography to sculpture to explore its different representations. Her work has been shown at various spaces throughout the United States, including David Crutt Projects, Sediment Arts, Trussell Gallery, and the Wasaic Project. She joined Transmitter Gallery as a co director in 2019 as a, and is enjoying doing their current work curating. So take it away, Jen. Okay. Um, so I think we can go to the first slide. I'm going to sort of do a back uh, a reverse job of what Jennifer just did and start with a project that is up in Fordham Plaza. Um, and this piece was, I conceived as the idea is as you move past it, you're moving from sort of a spring full saturation on the left, sort of the brightest and um, most like sort of saturated yellows and greens all the way through the summer season through the fall and into sort of a monochromatic winterscape as you move past it so it's sort of a, experiencing a different version of passing of time um and you can go to the next slide this is a close-up of i think uh, july um but it is as you can see, it's a bunch of uh, paper cutout plants that are printed and painted, hand, mostly at this point hand cut. I was hoping to have some laser cut when I proposed the project, but um, due to the pandemic, I was alone in the house. But the, um, you can see, and then go to the next slide too, sort of variety of colors and shapes, and then also dimension as well. So they'll, there's a, a panel of behind, wallpaper panel sort of behind all of the hanging plants. And you have this um, spatial movement that also exists within each window pane in addition to the saturation moving from sort of full saturation to monosaturation. Or, um, and then the next slide, please. And then this is uh, an example of the final sort of winter scene. Um, and in addition to the idea of moving through time and space, I also am playing, was playing off the ideas of camouflage and the play of shapes and shadows and form. In addition as well, um, more or less, and this goes to sort of earlier work, which you'll see in a second, the, uh, concept of that you see these sort of reprieves in especially urban areas, these high design areas of quote unquote living walls. Um, and then also you can find these sort of micro spaces in little corners or alleyways in New York City as well or high urban areas where it allows you to sort of take a deep breath or um, it's, its purpose oftentimes is to lower one's anxiety and to find sort of a moment of quiet and attunement. And so you can go to the next slide. <laughs> and this is a, from a few years ago. Um, all of these sort of paper cutouts came from a larger practice that I was, and currently still am um, investigating, thinking about simulacrum and mimicry, as well as the concept of the diorama. And so this uh, installation was sort of um, a wonky version of a natural history museum with these sort of displays of rocks and artifacts, as well as uh, these sort of rooms and wallpapers full of uh, paper foliage. So the next slide. And then this is another sculptural piece that really uh, tries to reference that high design concept that you see in a lot of urban spaces, the sort of living wall, the full lush, you go inside an office space and in the waiting area, there's this living, uh, full living sculpture. Um, but instead of not just mimicking it completely using 
the idea of, again, urban camouflage and vibrancy and then sort of a broken down uh, understanding or, yeah, wonky or broken down understanding of plant shapes, plant patterns, and again, that sort of just full saturation of life. So you can go to the next slide. And then this is sort of more of my, a lot of my sculptural practice at this point is again, sort of thinking about the di diorama and in instead of making a full environment using one singular piece as an identifier for a larger place, as well as thinking about, I started this a whole project thinking about um, what would happen if instead of collecting the pieces on a, of detritus sh shells, rocks, sticks, or whatever it is that one sort of picks up when on a walk or a hike or something, if I left it there, documented it and created what I call sister objects. And so there's sort of a full uh, mimicry of the object that sparked a thought or was um, interesting for me in the first place. And so on the top, you can see images of the original objects and then below are the um, recreated uh, sister objects. And the next slide, please. And so this is a whole compilation. And I was think I've started to really think about these objects as portraits of landscapes outside of the history of sort of landscape painting or history painting. Um, and so they operate as existing in sort of two places at once, but also being a real reference in its collection of a space and the environment that you're moving through and so you get a sense sort of of where you are based on the information of these pieces and how they're made and the colors they are, the types of rocks they are, plants, et cetera. And you can go to the next slide. And then this is a group, this is a, just a detail shot. Um, there were 69 crystals that I made, also all from this area behind my parents' house that uh, went through like a, a really high intensity fire. And one of the repercussions after really hot fires is that there can be massive erosion when the next rain happens and it unearthed all these gems. And so there, I took three of the uh, gems that uh, my mom found actually and reproduced them on mass. And so thinking about that also like how the accumulation and the representation of space can speak to a different, a specific setting and environment. And then the next slide. And then with that, after that crystal piece, I realized that I don't, I sort of wanted to play more on that idea of sort of mimicry and accumulation. And so I started creating more than just one singular sister object. And so this piece is a, portrait of a specific walk, but they're multiple um, mimicked or twinned items to create this sort of mountain cairn piece, um, as well as a few individual images as well. And that's where, that's the other part of my studio practice outside of my printmaking and paperwork. Okay, thank you. I have a question, I'm just gonna ask it now. Yeah. You say that you made crystals how did you do that? Um, so what is the same process that I do with the sister objects too, where I basically I'll make the first sister object using a variety. It's often like a Sculpey and plaster and everything. And then to make multiples, I'll then just make a mold of it. And then, so most of those are all hydrocal, some are resin, but mostly hydrocal. And then, uh, then hand painting all of them afterwards. They look great. Okay. Okay, Genevieve, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going on to Michelle Brody. Uh, Michelle is, a, is an environmental community-based artist who received her BA from Sarah Lawrence College in 1989 and her MFA from the School of, of the Art Institute of Chicago in 1994. Michelle has had one-person shows around the globe and is the recipient of numerous artist grants and residencies. 
locally, Michelle has worked with the Bronx Class on the Arts, Bronx Art Space, Bronx River Arts Center, and Wave Hill. Michelle has also completed two permanent public works of art for the MTA and, and Department of Education in the Bronx, where she works and resides. So thank you, Michelle. Okay, hi everybody. So I'm um, very excited to be a part of this exhibit. Um, what I'm gonna be focusing on is giving sort of a history behind this long-term project called Reflections in Tea that I've been doing since 2007. So if we'll go to the first slide. And um, this is of me in a coffee cart in Dumbo. So in, I had this idea for the Dumbo, what used to be the Art Under the Bridge Festival in Dumbo happening usually in the fall. Um, to serve tea from a coffee cart. And the whole idea was to create this coffee cart as a mobile tea house, where people were invited to come in one at a time to share with me a, a cup of tea and to tell stories. So next slide. Um, so what's on exhibit at um, Fordham Plaza now is based on a series of quilts that I've been creating where I brew the tea in special tea filters. And I think I have a detail on the next slide. So you can see that. Um, where I brew the tea with these special filters that are seven inches by four inches. So they're meant for brewing a pot of tea, of loose leaf tea. And then what I do is I save the tea bags and I dry them out. And then after they're dried out, I empty them and iron them flat. So they become like tea note papers. And then I hand these to people to write down their own story or a memory about tea. And then when I moved, this started in 2007, I moved to the Bronx in 2013. So then when I moved here, I started to actually collect a lot of stories about the Bronx and about the Bronx history and community. And so what we have up at Fordham, if you want to go to the next slide, is a, a comp. Oh, okay. So sorry, I'm forgetting my own order. So um, I wanted to say how I was doing this project in many different forms over the years, and I'll be showing some of those later. But uh, it all started with, um, again, having this tea house. So after I had the tea cart, I then built a little tea house out of copper and hanging on the walls are all the tea notes that people have written and I've collected over a thousand at this point and uh, was invited to install this work in the community gallery at the Bronx Museum in 2016 where I had regular tea sessions that people were invited to come in and have tea with me in the tea house and we were surrounded by all of the tea stories that people were invited to come and read. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, and so what I've been doing over the years, uh, since I've been in the Bronx, have been hosting a series of Senior Thursdays or senior events at the Bronx, at the Bronx Museum, where um, sometimes they focused on dance or poetry writing, uh, the most recent one I've been working on was music and singing. And uh, we would serve a tea along with a snack that was, uh, had a nice uh, taste pairing. And then if you go to the next slide, um, people would be invited during these events to write down their notes on the tea bags that were put on to, um, uh, to, a hard surface to write on. And these were just left for people to, to write on or during the community events, as I call them. Uh, we'll have the next slide. Um, people, the, in particular, the seniors that I worked with would then write down what they felt in terms of the food that they were eating, about the community, um, about being at the museum, you know, it really ranged on the stories. And I'm always collecting 
when I do the community sharings, um, I tell people to please write in whatever language they, they wish. So there's a whole mixture of English, Spanish, and there's some French and Hebrew in there, as well as uh, Chinese that I collected when I was in Taiwan and serving tea. So it's really a, a whole community effort, this project. Uh, next slide. I don't know, Laura, do we have the picture? I don't think you put in the pictures from, um, from Fordham that I sent to you. I don't know. Are but, they after this one? Uh, we'll see. I'm not sure. But um, basically, oh, you're going to, that's okay. You can go back. If they don't get shown, then we'll, we can put them up through the, um, the video. But uh, again, just showing how uh, this project called Reflections in Tea has had many different iterations. And it's not my only body of work. I actually, uh, in terms of its connection to the nature part of this exhibit, Natural Walls, I actually have done walls, Gene Genevieve, where I grow plants inside of fabric lace walls. Um, but I've been, I have an active practice of over 25 years and uh, to pick out and choose some of the works is just a, a long process. And so I wanted to just focus on this project, the tea project, which is what's hanging at Fordham Plaza right now. And um, this is more of my community-based work. And its connection to the nature is tea itself. I mean, tea is the second most imbibed beverage in the world next to water. And it all comes from one plant, the Camellia sinensis. And so um, what's pictured right now is a tea tent that's an even another mobile version of my tea houses that I'm actually gonna be installing in Bronx Park on August 15th for a joint tea day or a tea and nature day that I'm doing in collaboration with a group that's hosting a tea in, in uh, Prospect Park. And it's all about tea in the park, tea and nature. And so I'll have that, in, I have, I'll be putting that information up on my website. And so I'll be setting up my tea tent, which I actually built as part of a show at the Bronx River Arts Center back in 2017. Um, and then uh, installed in Central Park for uh, an exhibit of public art, temporary public artworks in Central Park. That was also later in the fall in 2017. Uh, next slide. Oh, so we're going back in time here. I just, again, showing the different ways that this tea project has found its way into the community. So this was a, a collaboration I did with a dancer and a reader. And this was back in, um, oh gosh, 2014 uh, or 15. And we um, had the tea house and the dancer, Create, uh, choreographed her own work, this is Sabine Haibush, to a reader reading from the stories that were collected on the tea. And it was talking about telling the story of tea as it uh, developed through history, from China to England and then to India. Uh, next slide. And this was at the, um, this was down at, in the Lower East Side. And so um, and we can go to the next slide. I think this is my last one. So yeah, we don't have images from the installation that I sent you. Um, but this is a, a compilation book that I'm selling that uh, at least documents three, my first three years in the Bronx of serving tea at the Bronx Museum and also at the Andrew Friedman home and the stories that have been collected in these various communities that I've uh, served tea and shared time with. That's it. Thank you. Hey, thank you. You know, I, w I wanted to ask, um, have you had the opportunity to talk with people who participated in earlier iterations of the project? Like, have they seen their work hanging in an exhibit or somewhere else? And how did that go? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've shared the book with people and then um, people have known one event and then come to another. So they often will come to the exhibit and look for their tea bag. Right. And sometimes they actually find them. Yeah, you have thousands of those pieces. Yeah, and they're all. Do you all, know how many you have? 
Uh, the exact number, I'm not 100% sure of. It's maybe somewhere around 1,200, 1,300. But each one is dated with the day that I had the tea, and that usually has the first name of the person and then the uh, venue, whether it was in the Bronx or in other locations like in Taiwan or Arizona, where I've also served. And just one other question. Did you choose tea because you're like a lover of tea or a big tea drinker? Or like why tea? Yeah, tea it originally comes out of an interest since I was in grad school. Um, I survived grad school by drinking highly caffeinated tea. And um, I just love the color, the colors that they leave. And so it was really an interest. And also in these tea bags, they leave their own, they, each one is almost like a tiny landscape. So it's, uh, it, you know, it, it connects with, um, I think, both of my fellow colleagues here, and that it's uh, each in individual tea bag is its story in and of its own, and it reflects a certain person, but it also has its own little landscape, which often look like the, the mountains in, in China, uh, where tea grows. And so yeah, yeah, all together, it does, they are very beautiful all together as, as, as a big quilt. Right? It just makes it like another project all together. And, and you know, thank you for participating. Thank you all, actually, all of you ladies for participating in our project. We kind of had some ups and downs because of, you know, the coronavirus, so, but everything worked out well. And the exhibit will be up until the end of the month, until June 31st at one Florida Plaza, right outside the Metro North Station. Um, does anybody have any questions? Could we see that, Yamar? Yes, I'm looking at the, um, the live right now and I'm looking at the chat and it doesn't seem that anyone's asking any questions quite yet. Actually, Laura, I have a quick question. Um, did you just say, you, you didn't mean to say June 30th, right? Because that's past. Oh, no, July 31st. July 30th. <laughs> yes. 31st. We're all lost in time that. here. Yeah, it's the end no, of this month, good. whatever this month is. <laughs> uh, I actually have a quick question for Genevieve. Mm -hmm. So what was the process in which you um, cut out or exacto knife all those individual pieces that you kind of put together? Because I imagine that that's a long, long process of individually cutting out all those leaves. So what was that like? Um, so some of them I already had. And then I would say I had probably 30% of them. It was just a lot. I mean, it was uh, as, yeah, it was just a long process of hand cutting. I would trace a lot of the previous ones and then add other cuts and then create a couple new plants. Um, the, uh, there were probably... I would say about half were printed and they were had already been printed on paper, like monotyped through a press um, beforehand. And then the other half were made just from painting and some, and some um, sort of a printed uh, painted hybrid. Um, yeah. And so it was, it was literally, I mean, it was just the time <laughs> and, but it was, Status. I mean, it's one of those kinds of things where you can call it sort of like you can put on a podcast or movie in the background and sort of plug through them. So it was something that I could do um, throughout the day when stuck at home and during COVID. And it was actually kind of fun because my uh, two-year-old daughter was able to help paint on some of the plants too. And so it was like sort of a fun activity we were able to <laughs> plug through the day together with. Yeah, thank you for that. And then we have a question from Moses Ross that says, have you exhibited together or collaborated before this? You mean all three of us? Yes, well, all four of you, because uh, right. Laura James is the curator and you guys are the artists. So have, you know, prior to this, have you guys exhibited together or collaborated in any sort of way, either individually or collectively? No, except I guess to be on the BX200 site. Is that correct, Laura? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know. You, Jennifer, have been in exhibits together up here in the Bronx? No. No. No, no collaboration. Well, I mean, Not we yet. will be having a, a faculty exhibit uh, at the Bronx River Art Center. We have a virtual one up right now, and it will be in the gallery, hopefully, later in August. 
Well, and all three of us were in the uh, Bronx Artist Documentary Project, weren't we? Oh, that's right. Of course. Well, yes. Laura, um, me, Laura, and you. I yes. Think. Yes. You know, Jennifer, I wanted to ask, um, what, how did you get to be so interested in um, traveling in Europe? Oh, well, um, I mean, I've always loved art. I've always loved art history. And um, I didn't ever actually get over to Europe when I was younger. Um, so when I was in grad school, I was actually, you know, just mostly doing work actually based on 17th century French illuminated manuscripts, but that's a whole nother story. And when I graduated grad school, I was able to save a little bit of money. I had, my best friend was going to Oxford in England. So I had a kind of a place to stay. And I spent like maybe two months over there and literally, um, I chose where I wanted to go by what museum they had, um, what pieces of art I've always wanted to see in person. And that just kind of, you know, lit, lit a, a fire under me. It, it, I just, I love going to see, especially some of the artwork that you can only see in person, like a lot of the Islamic tile work or the, the Greek and Roman um, mosaic work. You, you kind of really... I mean, you can see pictures of it, but they're very selective about what they take pictures of. You don't see the whole picture unless you're actually there. So it was just something I always wanted to do. And once I was able to, I just ran with it. <laughs> I see somebody is asking what it was like to come together during a pandemic mm -hmm. to create an art installation. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, you know, the, the great thing working with you three is that you were all really enthusiastic about it and just really wanted to show the work and knew that it would be um, accessible, even though it was a pandemic, you know, so you really, you know, you knew that it would be seen and you really wanted to, 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 um, to participate. So everybody made it up to the Bronx with their masks on and we got through it. And um, it, it actually went pretty well to put it together, to, you know, install. We installed it in one day. And, um, you know, thanks again. And it, it really was went off pretty yes, but Laura, a lot of credit goes to you, though, and your flexibility and your perseverance. So <laughs> I really think that, uh, I mean, it wouldn't have happened without you and your ability to, like, see it through. So I really am grateful to that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think that um, we've come to the end. The Amara, what do you think? <laughs>